We're standing here with my brother, no other, Zion the Lion Lex. What's going on, my brother? How's it been going? I'm good, I'm good, man. I'm good. It's a beautiful day out here at Thursday. We're doing good, man. I'm coming from work, but there's some things we want to deal with, right? Yeah, that's right. right. So, um, just to start it, um, start it off, how's the family? How's everyone? Is everyone good? Family life is good. The summer's been great to me. Um, the Torah, the brotherhood has been even greater. It's an amazing thing to revamp yourself and come back. You know, many of us uh, that walk in this way of life, sometimes uh, that path can get a little crooked. You know what I mean? But there's nothing like brotherhood to help strengthen and more importantly, straighten that path out. So with that being said, uh, as each summer passes, coming back into Torah stronger, each summer, each year, I feel stronger in this way of life and this truth. Hallelujah, that's great. So th th there's a few things to address, right? The first being, um, there was a video that I put up with, with um, Rabbi Chief Benyamin addressing Psalms 22, verse 17. 16 and 17 where he um a lot of christians use this particular verse as um as they say proof of the of the prophecy of a prophecy of the crucifixion of 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 jesus right um rabbi chipanyamin showed in the hebrew how it wasn't talking about piercing hands and feet it was it was speaking about you know they're at my hands and my feet you know so forth and but it so happened that there was a um there was a, a a person who chimed in on the on the comments and the discussion kind of got went back and forth and it got to the point of descendancy who are the children of israel um he kind of tried to um disprove that we were the children of israel right. or try to question who we were he tried to question the um rabbinic academy the israelite um rabbinic academy he questioned a lot of things and of course we questioned what he was doing but it got into a little bit deeper conversation um would you care to explain and expound on what what happened oh, i definitely will um let me let me let me say this um whenever we have uh europeans that comment on the torah and the culture of the tanakh Usually their comments are uh, followed with a strong, uh, disrespectful undertone. Uh, throughout the dialogue, I know you witnessed it, I witnessed it myself, the undertone of the message that the individual was sharing with us was, you know, it was disrespectful. It was, as some people would even coin, uh, pompous. You know, he seemed to be uh, sniffing himself, for lack of a better term, you know, and um, we don't play that, simply said. And, um, you know, when it comes to the culture of the Torah, is either you know it or you don't know it. It's either you practice and apply it or you don't. It's either you are it or you are not. And what he questioned was the very legitimacy to our claims as being biblical Israelites. So we don't have a problem with anybody questioning that. We actually deal with people that call themselves black Jews that don't consider themselves Israelites, that we have to actually battle some of these same claims with. Right. Right? So we don't mind anybody coming, but there's just something different about when a European has the audacity to look a black man in his eye or in dialogue with a black man and say, what gives you the right, right. to make such a statement, to make such a claim? So in dialoguing with this individual yesterday, there was some laughs that we got out of it, but there was something that he said that made me go back and do some research and a lot of the research that I did is a lot of the things that you and I have been talking about for months now but I happened to find something a little uniquely different um, he made the statement during our um, dialogue on Facebook that what gives us the audacity and authority to surname or proclaim ourselves as rabbis so what I did was wow really from a Hebraic perspective to make someone a rabbi is referred to as uh, a semika, uh, i.e. rabbinic ordination. Right. So I typed in the term semika in my uh, Hebrew literature app that gives me Hebrew literature from this era going back to the era of Moses. If it was written, it's on this app. So I typed it in there in the Hebrew and I found something amazing. What I found was a reference first and foremost in the Talmud that says that 
A question was asked to a famous Talmudic rabbi by the name of Marzutra. The question that was asked was, to where did the ten lost tribes exiled, where were they exiled? Where did the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, exile the ten lost tribes? Marzutra says, Afriki, which is the Hebrew word for Africa. Mm. Interesting, because we consider the Talmud to be Jewish literature. This is a literature that certainly the Jewish man reveres. Anyone that has ever visited a European shul will readily tell you that they teach more oral tradition, oral Torah, um, that which is separate from the Tanakh in their shuls. There is more Talmud teaching than Tanakh teaching. Mm. So that means that any European Jew would find a reference in the Talmud to not only be significant but extremely viable, strengthened and strong. So with that being said, here's a reference in Jewish literature telling you verbatim that the Ten Lost Tribes was taken into Africa. Something that they always try to act like, oh wow, there's African Jews? Why you act surprised it's in the literature that you have to memorize? Because when they are in these shuls learning the Talmud, they actually learn it through song. They're singing and chanting it every day. As a matter of fact, sometimes when you're dialoguing with European Jews and they restate something to you that's in the Talmud or even in the Tanakh, they'll sing it because they're memorizing it through song. So it's literally bond knit and attached to their memory. That means these guys literally know it like the back of their hand. That means that it also entails that they're being extremely disingenuous when they act surprised that there could be an African Jew when they know that the Talmud tells you the ten lost tribes are exiled to Africa. So, um, <clears throat> in the finest, can you go into detail right. as to what you found right. that that makes that makes this that brought us basically to this? You know, can you like what book, what passage? Where exactly did you find it? What was it a rabbi who who spoke about it? Like what exactly did you find? Because what I felt from the conversation and and going back and forth with the with the um with this person, I felt like there was a condescending um undertone as to question. You know, he I think at one point he said, What, you guys woke up one day Absolutely. and and just called yourself, you know, Israel. So my question to him was, Well, what makes you legit? What makes you a Jew? What was the thing that he said, Well, my mother and my father were Jews and blah blah but at what point did your conversion come? Exactly. And I and I posted a lot of questions to him as far as um I asked him about Yosef and his and his brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, yo, his, his brothers mistaking him as an as an Egyptian. Right. Moses being married to an Ethiopian woman. Um, I noticed he actually never touched on. He thing. never he never touched any of those things. Exactly. He didn't he didn't touch how Moses was mistaken as an Egyptian, right. and and he and he readily admitted that that um, Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, are Hermetic people, and he said that Ham is where the black. Right. Nations come from So if Ham To him If Ham is where the black nation Or the black people come from uh -huh. To be specific Then that means that The son of Ham Which is Misraim, Which is the name that we use for Egypt Right That He would have to be black also have to be black. So that means If Moses was mistaken as an Egyptian He had to look like, he had to look like an Egyptian right. If Yosef was mistaken as an Egyptian He had to look like him It take more than putting on somebody it takes more than putting on somebody's clothes to make an estate mistaken identity. Right. You know, some of the European Jews act as if, well, you know, Moses wasn't recognized as a Hebrew because he had on Egyptian garb. If Moses was snow white, like most of y'all are, right. with lily blonde, brown, and some of y'all with ginger red hair, right. it would be clear that Moses is no, from nowhere around here and it would possibly raise your eyebrows that he was a Hebrew right. or at least an Asiatic, right? right? If you think that they were all white. Right. But the reality is that the reason why Moses was mistaken as an Egyptian is the same reason why the Creator say, take your hand and put it in your bosom. And when you take it back out, it shall be white. And when you put it back in, it shall be black. We know that the miracle was in dark skin turning white. white. If Moshe's skin color, Moses' skin color looked like the average European Jew, we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, what is the miracle there? The I mean, I'd, I'd almost be moved that to think that you know you have some some kind of material in your shirt that kind of made that you know pull that off right. but you know again these are the games that they play because 
nine or ten times they think they're dealing with a spiritually illiterate people first and then a book illiterate people first they think that we don't read and they think that they're not that we're not genuinely spiritual right. until we actually uh, do things to demonstrate that number one we absolutely read and number two not only are we spiritual but you can't match the spirit that the creator put upon us because we are Yisrael right. you know what I mean there was a specific um snapshot or um screenshot right. that you put up that was all in Hebrew That's right, right? And you had a few words highlighted. <laughs> Can you explain to the people that might not understand Hebrew, might not read Hebrew, can you explain to the people what exactly is it that you put up there? Pull it up right now as we're speaking because they say seeing is believing. Right. So while we're sitting here, I'm going to take the time to actually set it up. Because I think it's very interesting, and this comes from their writings, right? It comes from their writings. Um, do you know what book? Uh, Rabbi De Eliezer It's called Rabbi who? De Eliezer So there's a book Written in the 8th century By 8th century rabbi Known as Rabbi Eliezer There's a book Based on a lot of his Understanding and learning Called Perke De Rabbi Eliezer Which stands for The works Or the ethics Of Rabbi Eliezer It's basically a treatise On, on some of his Greatest works um, There's a particular chapter Chapter 23 In some books But in the original book is chapter 24 that makes this statement throughout Perkei Day Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer he's actually commenting on Genesis through Deuteronomy right. when he gets to Genesis chapter 10 he makes some interesting statements he says we have a tradition according to which both the Semites and the descendants of Ham were black Japheth being the only white son of Noah and it's found in rabbinic tradition According to the 8th century Rabbi Eliezer in his book Perke de Rabbi Eliezer, Noah brought his sons and his grandsons and he blessed them with their several settlements and he gave them as an inheritance all the earth. He especially blessed Shem and his sons black and comely and gave them the inhabitable earth. He blessed Ham and his sons black like a raven and he gave them as an inheritance the coast of the sea. He blessed Yafet and his sons, they entirely white, and gave them for an inheritance the desert and its fields. This is to be found in what we call today Jewish literature. Wow. So, like the verse I quoted earlier that showed you that there's a Talmudic source that tells you the ten lost tribes were sent into Africa, here we have another source from another very famous rabbi in the Jewish community known as Rabbi Eliezer in, of the 8th century CE, common era, or as the Christians say AD, who says verbatim, Shem was black, blessed, entirely black. So because i know that the individual we were dialoguing with also speaks hebrew i actually maybe you could show the camera and maybe when we put it back up we could actually show it um as a screenshot but uh, i actually took the hebrew part from the book and i sent it to him online and as many people who were watching the dialogue saw he lost his mind after that oh yes he did i, I almost became a nigger. he said i should call you the n-word we have a uh, he called me an a-hole and he said, I should call you an N-word. And I said, wow, I guess my tactics were working because I ruffled his feathers. They say that a peck of wood is not just someone who is poor white trash. A peck of wood is also someone who has poor understanding and poor education. So as we were dialoguing, you know me, I know how to get under somebody's skin. I continue to call him what he is, a peck of wood. Anytime you exude lack of scholarship as a white man they're gonna call you a peck of wood unlike you though me being black whether i'm smart whether i'm dumb whether i'm rich and i'm poor y'all gonna call me a nigga so at least i'm being accurate with the way i'm describing you because i'm reflecting your poor understanding when i say that you the peck of wood so this goddamn peck of wood had the nerve to actually write on the post excuse me he had the nerve to write on the post that I got to be an a-hole and he's and I'm lucky that he don't call me the n-word all because I shared with him in English and in Hebrew Leshem Lebana Shachorim Shem and his sons were blessed black Berek Leshem Lebana his sons Shachorim black once he read that in the Hebrew the game was over 
Now, can, can you give the people the reference where the, the the exact place where they could find it? Okay, so in the, um, in, in the app. That all you right. Got it. So I want everybody to be privy to these Jewish literature that co-sign who we are. I want you to go on Android if you have Android. I want you to go on the Apple Store if you have the um, iPhone. And I want you to download an app that's called Safaria. S-E-F-A-R-I-A. S-E-F-A-R-I-A. When you download the app, I want you to type in P-I-R-K-E-I. D-E-R-A-B-B-I Eliezer. And go to the 24th chapter. When you go there, you'll see what I just read. And the Creator blessed Shem and his sons, black and beautiful. But that'll be just for the people who read Hebrew. And that's for the people who read Hebrew. Right. For those who don't read Hebrew, I could share with you the English translation. And we'll put that. And we'll put that in the original video when right. we go back and we look at this video. Right. So, but there was another very interesting point that we were talking about because he spoke about ordination. He spoke about ordination and and what gives out and what gives the the um the Israelite Hebrew um academy legitimacy, right? right? right. I pointed out to him what gave the European um Rabbinic schools legitimacy. I I told them I said you know you got conservative Jews you got reformed Jews. I said and they um they accept homosexuality which is totally against the laws of God, right? And they make them rabbis. Right. I said, so I said, we don't we don't have to answer to anyone to be something that we already are. Right. So if a brother wants to call himself a rabbi, which in terms for them means teacher, right? right? We got many teachers in the midst right. of us. And if we and if they if brothers want to call themselves rabbi, that's as legit as a European calling himself a rabbi. Right. So he tried to dis he basically discredited mm -hmm. the school that um that um, Rabbi Chief Benjamin came from, but then in your studies, you also found something else. Mm. Would you care to share with, with, with people <laughs> to show about legitimacy and who is who and how their people, the European Jews, right. looked at black people when it came to this whole ordeal about, rap, about rabbinic schools and, and rabbis and, and things of that nature? So this right here deals a mighty blow to the European Jewish community. And we say all praise to the Creator for allowing us to be open-minded, to stick our necks out, to be able to be privy to this information. We always say that in order to acquire wisdom, one has to put himself in a position and an environment to grow. So we're hoping that future generations, the current generation, those that are watching, but especially future generations, understand that in order to grow in Torah, you don't just put your head inside the Torah. Our fathers were blessed with understanding the natural sciences, mathematics, um, philosophy, psychology. All of these are things that our forefathers mastered. And when the Torah says that Solomon was blessed with wisdom beyond measure, it starts to name things that you can't find in the Torah. So we know that we can't stop our learning. If anything, we can set up a gate or a fence to make sure that what we're learning doesn't counter what we're practicing. But it should never stop you from going out and learning because you wouldn't encounter things that we found. So after the dialogue that myself and Chief Uzael had with a European Jew, of which he questioned our authority to call ourselves a rabbi, I said, let me type in Samika, which is the ritual ordination. Let me, let me see every time it was used in so-called Jewish literature. And let me see something real quick. That's just how I study. And it brought me to something called Vilna Gehon's letter to the lost tribes of Israel. Now, who is Vilna Gehon? The Vilna Gehon is the foremost European Jew in European Jewry. They consider him to be greater than all of their greats. This is not... Um, so he's the H... J-I-C. He's the H-J-I-C of the Jewish community. <laughs> Vilna Gehon is the H-J-I-Z or the H-A-I-C, the head Ashkenazi in charge. Right. And he believed himself to be in the era of the Mashiach during his lifetime. With that being said, he knows that the Messianic era would be 
immediately preceded by the tribe's awakening as we see ourselves now we're awakening first and then we know the mashiach is coming next with that being said he said we have to find the 10 lost tribes as if him and levy is already found as if he's actually <laughs> judah right. which we know you're not right <laughs> that was funny so what he does is you know he goes and he sends out an expedition into various parts of africa to try to reconnect with the history of eldad the danite who was spoken of in Rudolf R. Windsor's from Babylon to Timbuktu in page 92. Rudolf Windsor gave us this history. Bless me, his memory may it continue. He is still here with us today, and we pray that the Creator continue uh, his strength and his vitality because the work that he produced is immense and still making greatness in the earth. He wrote in page 92 extensively about Eldad the Danite's travels into Europe, how he comes into Europe and is surprised to see European Jews in the 8th century. Where did we get this from? So the European Jews that he counters say, hey, who are you? How long have you been around? He said, me and my people been around for over a millennia. The European Jews answered, oh, we've only been around for about 50 to 100 years. Wow. Major difference. The Jews in Africa have a history, continuous history from the era of Solomon up until the 8th century CE. You don't see Jewish people in Europe until about the late 8th century CE or AD. And what he pointed out was that there's a need for these people to come and learn Torah from the original Jews in Africa. So Eldad the Danite is the one that actually came into uh, Europe and helped to instruct them. This follows the book called the Kuzari, which is the source book or the source material for Arthur Kostler's 13th tribe. Mm. Okay, I'm giving you a little too much. We're going to come back and deal with this at another time more extensively. But to make it a little speedily but yet to the point, I'm going to read something real quick. This letter is a letter from the Vilna Gehon students in 1830. They're writing and they say, a letter sent by the elders and rabbis of the Ashkenazic community in the land of Israel. That means whoever they're writing to is not Ashkenazic. All right. They say... We're presenting this letter to the Bene Moshe and the ten tribes of Israel, the lost tribes. And now we're going to go into what they actually say. The Creator helps people become attached to the Torah okay. before the coming of the Mashiach. Mm. And as we have heard, you have a Sanhedrin. These are European Jews writing to the original true Jews of color in Africa and saying to them, we have heard that you have a Sanhedrin ordained from those who are ordained as you adjudicate capital cases. Please select some of your ordained wise men to come to Israel and ordain scholars. Let me read that again for people who may not understand what that entails. Right. This is a letter written by an extremely well-known and revered European Jewish rabbi's students who continued his work after his death. His work was to locate and find the ten lost tribes. He didn't find them. He went to every place but where they were, but his students were able to get a hold of them. And where were they located? In West Africa. So here now is where the students take the letter, and here is what they write to those uh, Israelites in West Africa. Please select some of your ordained wise men to come to Israel to ordain scholars so that we also will have a court comprised of ordained learned men in Israel. Here's a question that I have to ask and a statement. Let me start with the statement and I'll follow back with the question. For those who may not know, to ordain someone to be a scholar is to make them a rabbi. You don't ordain a scholar. Right. You, you, if you were a scholar in a Jewish, in a, from a Hebraic perspective, you were a scholar. Right. The only person that becomes ordained is a rabbi. a rabbi. So they're saying, can you come from Africa to come and ordain us as rabbis? Right. So here's the irony in all of this that we're discovering right now. We had a dialogue with a European Jew just yesterday, right? Right. Where he questioned our authority to call ourselves rabbi. Right. When the reality is, 
less than two to three hundred years ago, it was our ancestors that gave them the authority to function as rabbis. Right. Because as this letter proves, from European Jewry to West African Jewry, we are the ones that came into Israel and set them up and ordained them as rabbis. And we have the letter in their literature as proof. The letter is as per uh, the words verbatim, a letter from the Vilna Gehon students to the Ten Lost Tribes. Now I'm going to tell you, in the letter, just so you know what particular landmass we're talking about, where the uh, Ten Lost Tribes are described to have been. Please. I think that's very important. This is extremely important. And this brings out another lesson uh, that we can share as well. We are writing to the Ten Lost Tribes who exist beyond the rivers of Kush. Uh-oh. Now I have a question, Chief. Africa. Now I have a I have a question, Chief. That's Africa. We already saw in the Talmud in Tractate 94a that the European rabbis know that the ten lost tribes were exiled to Africa, correct? Right. All right. We already saw that the Vilna Gehon is writing to tribes in Africa, correct? Correct. Now they're describing the region in Africa that these tribes dwell. We are writing to the Ten Lost Tribes who dwell beyond the rivers of Cush. Now I have a question for you, Chief. You read a little Hebrew, right? right. None of us um, in our 20 or 30 years can say that we are master Hebrew teachers. Right. I don't think so. I think I know some master Hebrew teachers, right. but all of them got way more years than us. Right. So at the least bit, we are somewhat functional within the language, but enough to know what's right and what's wrong, right? right? Have you ever seen the term Ever spelled Ayin Beit Resh translated as beyond? No. This is the word that is the root word for Hebrew. Right. This is what Abraham was called. Abraham did what? He crossed over. Right. When you cross over, you do what? You go from one side to another. To another right? We know that there's a verse in the book of Zephaniah. I believe it's 312, where it says, From beyond the rivers of Cush shall my worshippers come, right? Now I have a question, Chief. Kush is what part of Africa? So Kush would be Ethiopia, and Ethiopia, in terms of looking at the landmass of Africa, is what? The north, south, east, or west coast? We have Ethiopia here, that would be the east coast, the right? East coast, right? Okay, if the Creator says, Beyond. from the other side, because this is what Ever means, if the Creator says, May Ever Kush, from the other side of Kush, shall my worshippers come what's the other side of east west that's west right so that means we're running and chasing cat behind mouse deuteronomy 28 deuteronomy 28 to establish our identity not realizing that zephaniah 312 tells you as well because zephaniah 312 tells you from the other side of the rivers of kush shall my worshipers come the other side of east africa is west africa so that means he is speaking directly to those on the West African coast. But let's say you don't believe me. Let's say you think I'm stretching. Let's say you think Zion Lex is telling an untruth. Right. He also says, in reference to that region, it's the land of Havila. Havila. This is interesting. There's an oil company that is Israeli that is in Ghana today. That's called, where's Ghana, by the way? That's in West Africa, right? There's an oil company that's Israeli in origin that resides in Ghana that's called Havila Oil. Wow. That means the European Jews know that Ghana in particular and the West Africa on a whole represented the region that the Torah refers to as Havila, where the gold is. And we know that West Africa was minerally rich in gold for years because this is the place where Mansa Musa came from. The world's trillionaire, forget billionaire, we're talking about the world's first trillionaire, Mansa Musa, a black man. Nobody has ever amassed as much wealth as Mansa Musa has. And where does he hail from? West Africa, as Genesis chapter 2 says, where the gold is, Havila, correct? correct. All right. So in further describing the region that these letters are being sent to, it says this region is the region of Havila. Anybody says, well, how do we know that Havila is the west coast of Africa? Just look at modern day. When you go to Ghana, there's an oil company in there called Havila Oil. Set up by Israelis. 
when you go inside any uh, Israeli or Hebrew search engine and you look up Havila, all of them come up and tell you Ghana. When you look at the land masses that Genesis chapter 2 is describing as the borders of Eden, you already know that it's talking about not just Ghana, but even including up to the Sudan. It's extremely important that we come back to our history, we come back to our culture, and more importantly, we come back to our language so that we can capture the essence of the Torah. This find right here is probably one of the most important finds um, I don't want to say of our era, but I would say in this day and time, right? I'm speaking in humility right now because we don't need European Jewish approval to tell us who we are. We've been fighting tooth and nail among our own people to do that. Right. But we don't do that among European Jews. If you don't believe that I'm an Israelite, I don't care. The onus is not even on me to prove that to you because at the end of the day, who are you? The onus is on me to tell my brother who he is, to tell my sister who she is. That is what we go out of our way to prove. Right. But still, in light of that, this is powerful. Because for the first time in the Israelite community, we are privy to Jewish European literature that tells you verbatim, we know the 10 lost tribes were exiled in Africa, Sanhedrin 94a. We know that the 10 lost tribes resided on the other side of the river of Cush, West Africa, where Havila is. And on top of that, we know from their own writing, they're writing to us, asking us to make them rabbis in the land of Israel during the time that you see the first European settlers enter the land of Israel. For those that don't know History 101, the first Europeans that are beginning to emerge and come into Israel to settle is in the late 1700s. You have a trickle that comes through in the early 1600s, but you have the majority of bigger groups coming in the late 1700s. The first thing they encountered was opposition from the natives. What's the first obvious opposition? They don't look like no other surrounding nation. Right. So what gives them a stamp of approval? They got to go to the original Jews of color that are in Africa. Nobody questioned your identity during this time. Everyone was aware where the real Jews were. Remember, Spain and Portugal just released over one million Jews of color in 1492 to West Africa. We're only talking about 200 years later, the 1700s. Almost three, right? right? When we talk about the time period, 1492 to 1780, Inquisition. the Spanish Inquisition. So follow me. The identity of the Jews of color was not in question in the late 1700s because it was already known in world history Spain and Portugal had already released during the Spanish Inquisition over one million Jews of color to West Africa. So everyone knew at that time the real Jews were in West Africa. They didn't release them into nowhere in Europe. They released them into West Africa. These are parts of the world that they released them to that Spain and Portugal own because just like the United States had us come in and deal with the cotton and the Caribbean had us come in and deal with the sugar cane, we went to mine gold in the West Indies initially. So with that being said, this piece of literature that we discovered, uh, myself, you, because of this dialogue is extremely powerful because again, we have our own identity that we can see within the Torah. But when we are having a dialogue with surrounding nations who question our authority, especially including the European Jew, we now can say, don't play games.